In our culture, we know great people. And we show them that we think they're great by paying them a lot of money. And so if you were Lionel Messi, the greatest soccer player in this world, you'd be handsomely compensated. He makes uh, $55 million a season at the club where he's playing right now. Uh, Google and Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai makes $255 million a year for his leadership of that conglomerate. Movie star Tom Cruise raked in a cool $100 million at the box office last year for his role in Top Gun Maverick. Now, if you were to go to the places where these people work, if you were to go to the clubhouse in Miami where Messi is currently a star, you wouldn't expect to see him gathering up all of the other players' laundry so he could take it home to wash it. If you went to Google headquarters, you wouldn't expect to see Sundar Pichai scrubbing the floor. If you went to the movie set where Tom Cruise was starring, you wouldn't expect to see him behind the craft services table. We see certain jobs as being important and other ones as being unimportant, and we don't expect important people to do the unimportant jobs. Now, in the culture where Jesus is operating, people have a real sense, even more than we do today, of certain jobs giving a person importance and other jobs taking away their importance. And in that time and place, in uh, Judea or in Galilee in that time, among the, the faithful Jews, nothing could get you more impressive results in people's eyes, more well, nothing can get you more prestige than being a rigorous follower of the law. And so the people that everybody model themselves after, the ones that they would like to be like, the, the rock stars, movie stars, CEOs of their age, are the people like the Pharisees who practice the law with the highest degree of rigor. But the, they coveted the respect that it got them. And so Jesus tells his followers that they should not follow the example of the Pharisees. In Matthew 23, we read this. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on others' shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the places of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. Earlier in the gospel, Jesus gives a new paradigm for fulfilling the law. Love not rigor. Someone asks him what the greatest command is, and he says, loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And that on these two things hang the law and the prophets. In other words, rigor to the teachings of the law is secondary to love in the practice of the law. And the Pharisees, rigor is all about self-importance, about being seen rather than about love and concern for other people. And so Jesus tells them not to follow the example of the Pharisees, but to follow his example. His example that exemplifies humility. When the crowd wants to make Jesus king by force, Jesus refuses. When there's no one to be found to wash the disciples' feet at the Last Supper, Jesus does it as an example of his greatness. And of course, Jesus goes to the cross to save those who by rights are his enemies. 
to Jesus' followers, loving service and sacrifice are meant to be the marks of honor and praiseworthiness. After he washes his disciples' feet, Jesus tells them that they must follow his example. In John 13, 13 to 17, he says, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do that. So we're not to be like the Pharisees who try to look good in people's eyes. Instead, we're supposed to be like Jesus who doesn't care what people think about him, but he loves people. And so he's willing to be seen as less than in order to faithfully serve them. Now, what does this look like when it's put into practice in a life other than, obviously, Jesus' life? We can... Look in the life of the Apostle Paul and see this same principle borne out. Paul, of course, might be considered the greatest missionary in the history of the church, the greatest theologian in the history of the church, and one of the great examples of a Christian worth emulating in our lives. But of course, Paul doesn't look impressive to the people at the time when he is operating. In Roman society, there's a strong sense of class division. There are certain things that make a person important, and there are certain things that make a person unimportant. And Paul does the things that make him look unimportant because he has taken to heart the message of Jesus. So Paul accepts the social downgrade because he knows that in the kingdom of God, humble service, not the adulation of other people, is what gives him credibility. And so writing to the Thessalonians, he appeals to them on the basis of the work that he's done for them. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 9-12, we read this, Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel to you. You are our witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believe. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and his glory. Paul earns the right to encourage, to admonish, to rebuke the people, because of his humble service. The love that he has that has been demonstrated in his willingness to do the things that make him look less. But not everybody has gotten the memo. Paul started the church in Corinth, and he stayed there for a year and a half, but eventually he had to move on because God called him to other places. And in his absence, some people have come from the church and have claimed that Paul doesn't really know what he's doing. Because Paul seems so unimpressive. Oh, that Paul. He didn't even charge you for preaching the gospel. You must have got what you paid for. (laughs) Paul, oh, he's just not an impressive speaker. You know, you need to listen to people like us. And Paul, being humble, doesn't like to brag, but... Paul, from a distance, is forced to reassert his authority over that church, not because he has a need to be in charge, but because if these people are allowed to be in charge, they're going to disciple these people into a gospel of self-importance, not into a gospel of humility. And so he pushes back. In 2 Corinthians 11, starting in the second half of verse 21, he says, Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. He can go toe-to-toe with them. 
about these things that they think look important, but he doesn't want to spend his time dwelling on these things because he knows that in Christ's view of the world, that doesn't make him important. And so he can't help but bring up all of the things that disqualify him in the eyes of these other people. But in the estimation of anyone who who sees the world through the lens that Christ has given them, shows his authority to the church. So he continues, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jew the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jew, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I've labored and tailored, and I've often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all of the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Paul's sacrifice is an expression of love and a participation in the suffering of Jesus. Jesus overcomes by suffering, by giving himself for us and asks us to follow him picking up our crosses. And so Paul does this, knowing that when people see his sacrifices on behalf of the kingdom of God, they see a picture of Jesus. He becomes Jesus' hands and feet and shows people what Jesus is like. That's the kind of light that Jesus is pointed towards. But in our own cultural context, this is truly countercultural. When we think about the kind of lives we want to live, or more to the point, when we think about the kind of lives we'd like our children to live, we tell them to aim high. And so if our kid is a gifted hockey player, we say, wouldn't it be great if you could be a superstar in the NHL? If our kid is good at at business, if they have shown an entrepreneurial spirit, maybe we think that they should be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. If our kid has shown charisma and leadership, maybe we think that they should be prime minister one day. We want the best for them, but our assumption is that the best is to be made much of. But Jesus doesn't value upward mobility. His life is downwardly mobile. Think about the Incarnation. Jesus isn't born in a palace. He's born in a barn. Jesus doesn't come from a well-connected family. Yes, okay, he's descended from King David, but that and a couple of bucks will get you a cup of coffee at that time and place. Jesus doesn't grow up near the centers of power in Rome or even in Jerusalem. Instead, he grows up in a provincial backwater, Galilee. One of his disciples, when hearing that he's from Galilee, says, Oh, can anything good come from Galilee? When Jesus attracts the following, it's not the learned. It's not the prestigious people who follow him. It's the crowd. The people that that the learned and important people see with such derision. Oh, those unlearned, undiscerning people who don't, oh, they're just disgusting. Yuck. What do they know? And of course, when Jesus dies, he dies a criminal's death. But in the church, we struggle to take this to heart, that this is the measure of what glory looks like. We seek to be impressive and to have influence. I was recently listening to a podcast about the fall of a noted megachurch pastor who started out with a lot of promise. But when things started to grow, he kind of got his eyes off the ball and started to see his own self-importance as the most important thing. Some people recommended that he maybe submit himself to the mentorship of a person who maybe had a little bit more seasoning and a little bit more experience. 
And he refused that because that guy's church was smaller than his. Which I find kind of hilarious because Jesus' church had like 12 guys in it. Church culture elevates people for the wrong reasons. It says that we want to amplify your message if you're a leader with lots of butts in the seats on Sunday morning. If you can sell lots of books or tickets to conferences. Or if you're a media influencer where you get lots of eyeballs on YouTube. Or you get clicks and likes and follows. We've made being a gifted communicator not a humble servant of Jesus. The thing that makes you great in our eyes in the church. And from that, we have reaped a seemingly never-ending series of scandals. Putting people on pedestals is dangerous, both for the people we put on the pedestals and for those who look to the people on the pedestals. When we elevate somebody, we remove accountability. Because when you have a golden child, nobody wants to see anything happen to them. And so we protect them, even when we shouldn't. And lots of instances of, of scandals involving church or ministry leaders, there have been warning signs. There have been people who've made allegations to the people who are supposed to be overseeing that person. And the allegations get swept under the rug because everybody has a vested interest in keeping things going the way they are rather than in exposing the truth. When we tell people that they're special and remove accountability from them, it causes problems. We might think that the scandals are about the bad apples that avoided detection. But when you see the sheer number of the scandals that have happened, you have to start to wonder if it's a case where we didn't see some bad apples or if we've created a system that makes apples go bad. Holding people up on pedestals takes the latent character flaws that exist in all of our lives as imperfect, unfinished, redeemed creations of Christ, and it amplifies them, usually until they explode. And it's not just this person who's been put on a pedestal that's set up for failure. It's also the people who look for the for, for salvation from that person on the pedestal that also feel the brunt of this. Of course, there are the people who suffer abuse at the hands of people like that. So many of the church scandals involve financial, emotional, spiritual, or sexual abuse. And so obviously, those people get hurt in the process. But it's not just those people who've been directly abused that get hurt. It's also the people who hoped in somebody and showed that that hope was misplaced. It leads to disillusion. A friend of mine I was talking to a few months ago, and I was asking about his son and daughter-in-law, who I've known for a long time. They were going to a church in which the pastor was somewhat recently discredited, and they just stopped going to church. And unfortunately, this is not an isolated incident. If I say that, you say, oh, I probably, you probably know somebody who's been in a similar boat. Who's been so disgusted by what they've seen in the church that they've left. And it's not just something that happens in big churches with big ministry leaders. It's just it's much more visible and sort of shocking when it happens that way. But it happens all over the church when we take our eyes off Jesus and make important the things that the world says are important rather than the things that God says are important. We see it in the example of domineering pastors who think that they know better, and so they're willing to do strong-arm tactics in order to get you where they know that you need to be. We see it in the, the example of ministry leaders who are more interested in being seen to be in charge than actually in serving anybody. We see it in the person sitting beside you in a pew who loves to look down their nose at you because it makes them feel better about themselves. When we take our eyes off of Jesus and put them on ourselves or on any other person that we want to hold up as an exemplar, then disappointment and damage always happens. 
So who do we follow? We follow the example of Christ in the other people. People who humble themselves in the way that they humble themselves. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Paul's claim to authority comes from his imitation of Christ's humility and suffering. We should follow people not for their skills, but for their willingness to humbly serve in the way that Jesus did. Jesus doesn't need to control people. Jesus doesn't need to exploit people in order to get an audience. Jesus serves. To follow His example is to become glorious. And so we need to look for people in our lives, people in our churches, who follow Jesus' example of humble service, and we need to follow their example of following Jesus' example of humble service in the places where they follow Jesus' act of humble service. Ask them questions about their faith. Spend time. Get to know them. Ask how they've been able to be humble. Don't assume that somebody's position correlates with their godliness. You know, I hope that as a pastor, I've humbly served enough that I've got credibility to speak. But there are people in, in this church who don't have titles, but whose example of humble service and dedication means that they should be a person worth imitating. Seek out those people. Don't worry about whether or not they have a, a title or not. They have credibility because they are like Jesus. So don't give in to the temptation to try and look self-important. God isn't impressed by titles, but by humble service. We need to remember that in the kingdom of God, Jesus is the measure of glory. It doesn't matter if we look important in the eyes of the world if we look unimportant in the eyes of God. So let's earn God's approval by following Jesus' example.